Hello and welcome back to Well That Aged Well. This week I'm joined by David Parnell, who has written Belisarius and Antonina, and th those are the topics of this week's episode. And before we begin with talking about Belisarius and Antonina, I want to begin with, as you do in your book, I want to begin by discussing the sources behind, and especially, of course, the secret history that is a bit maybe a bit controversial, even among historians today. As I said, it seems to have always been um, because we don't know we, today. People, have, as my understanding, the people usually took that word truth up until recently, fairly, fairly recently, people have taken it. But now they're beginning to kind of understand that maybe, maybe there's not everything is in there is the truth of what we know about the Nazarius or Justinian or Antonina or Theodora and the. The old gang. So let's begin with talking about some of the sources available to us for Belisarius and Antonina, and of course Justinian as well. Absolutely. Uh, let me thank you for letting me on your podcast, and I would be happy to start us off with talking about the sources because you can't really write a book about Belisarius and Antonina, or for that matter, about Justinian and Theodora without grappling with this historian, uh, Procopius, because he is he is a giant uh, in the field of history. Um, he's probably the most important and well-known historian of the entire sixth century, uh, which is saying a lot because we have we have a good number of histories from this period. But Procopius was very intelligent and he wrote uh, very prolifically. And his work was preserved, which means we still have it to read today, whereas many of his contemporaries who might have written equally well, um, their work was not preserved or it's only preserved in small fragments. So Procopius is very important. it was hidden for quite important. some time, wasn't it? Because that's the, hence the secret title, the secret history, not to be confused with the mongrel secret history, but it's uh, it wasn't found until, I believe, the late, later after Byzantine fall, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. So the secret history that Procopius written uh, was, I believe, we can't prove this for certain, uh, not actually shared with anybody during Procopius's lifetime. I think he wrote it and, and then stuffed it in a drawer or a cabinet, and it was discovered after his death uh, and and stuffed away in somebody's library. The first kind of mention Indiana we Jones have, style. yes, exactly, yes. <laughs> Uh, so the first mention we have of it is in the ninth century. So uh, it's possible other people read it in between when Procopius died in the 560s, probably, and the ninth century. But the first time we know somebody else read it isn't until the ninth century. Um, so there was some considerable time that lapsed before we know anybody read it. So we know that somebody read it in the ninth century. It made it into a list of books that educated people should know about. Um, and then it, you know, goes back into uh, back into somebody's bookcase or whatever, uh, and it's not really discovered and translated in the West and make its way into Western historiography um, until the 16th and 17th centuries. So um, it's it's something that has a very outsized impact now in how we look at these figures. But for vast periods of time in the past, it was virtually unknown uh, by by many people who did know something about history. Um, so we we have to talk about the secret history, and it's very important. But it's also interesting to think about it in, in this long term of how it was very not important at other times. How how did the perspective? How was did people view Belisarius, especially in the West, before the discovery? But uh, on on the secret history before and how did it change the view of both Belisarius, Antonina, and Theodora, and Justinian after the re rediscovery and uh, for maybe a third time, or first time in the West of, of the secret history. Yeah, that's a, a great question. So if you look at Procopius's other major work, uh, the history of the wars, um, the four people that you've mentioned, Belisarius, Antonina, Justinian, and Theodora, they all come off relatively well um, in the wars. Um, it's not by any means a pay on to their success. Uh, Procopius does include some criticism within the history of the wars. He tr tries to maintain a sort of even tone about some of these figures but uh, but overall they come off very well uh, and if you just had that to go off of you'd think of belisarius as this heroic general 
you think of his wife as a dutiful woman who accompanied her husband uh, and helped him out. You'd think of Justinian uh, as um, an overworked, but you know, an emperor who largely cared about his empire uh, and Theodora as a spouse who supported him. So we had this impression, if you don't take the secret history into account, of uh, people that were were good public servants, uh, were not perfect, uh, but but did their best uh, and largely succeeded at most of their goals. Um, and then the secret history, uh, when that's added into the mix, <laughs> throws many wrenches uh, into that 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 machinery of that picture uh, and, and starts to make it quite quite a bit more complicated. So let's begin uh, as you do as well, our mid Antonina and. Yeah, because it's my understanding that we know much more about Antonina than Belisarius of childhood and upbringing than maybe because she was came from quite a common background and you know she was maybe a little more exotic in a way. Was that is that how we or how much do we actually think that we not, what we know from the sources that we can rely on that this may may have been her upbringing. That's that's a great question. And I'll just say before I respond about Antonina in particular, that uh, I think it's worth mentioning that we know a good amount about both Belisarius and Antonina, which is why I was able to write this book in the first place. Mm. But even though we know a lot about them relative to other people of the sixth century, we still are faced with huge gaps uh, in our knowledge of their lives. So it's it's very important to emphasize to your listeners, I think, that trying to reconstruct the lives of people who lived 1,500 years ago is an order of magnitude more difficult and, and in some ways impossible than trying to reconstruct the life of somebody who lived, say, within the last century or within the last two centuries. Like we just we don't have the kind of documentary evidence we would like to have. We don't have things like birth certificates uh, or uh, uh, death certificates or uh tax returns uh, or anything like that uh, for these figures. So we are we are doing the best we can with limited mentions. That said, we do know some things uh, about them, uh, more than many of their contemporaries. They're, they're very well-documented people for their time period. So Procopius tells us that Antonina had uh, a father and a mother. The father was a chariot oh, racer and the mother was an actress. Uh, and this then sort of forms what we can know about Antonina's childhood, uh, that she came from this entertainment background and a time period in which entertainers were not the same type of popular figure they are today. Um, they enjoyed some popularity, but not respectability. They weren't like um, Brad Pitt or Angelina Jolie or any of those people. They were like superstars of their time. Right. Um, they weren't superstars in the sense that modern superstars get invited to fancy events with the rich and famous, right? Like today, mm -hmm. you know, the rich and the famous or politicians, they want to associate themselves with these entertainers, with with uh, actresses, with um, top athletes, you know, the in the United States, you know, the teams that win championships get invited to the White House to meet the president. Uh, and everybody who's a politician wants to have these famous people at their rallies or their events or whatever. Um, in the ancient world, they might have been popular with the common uh, sports goer uh, or the common um, attendee at the theater, but they would never have been breaking into that upper crust. They would have been held back from the elites of society. So they might have even gotten rich and they might have had a certain amount of popularity with the lower classes, but they wouldn't have been they would have been a part of the the elite like that we see them in our society today. So let's talk about how Antonina became an actress or as you say you say in the secret history, they you almost write about her because he he almost seems to view Actor, actresses uh, or actors as harlots as well and it wasn't just acting that was a part of the job the job description to put it that way yes so there was a general association of actresses in particular with sex work um, so there was a general understanding that if a person was willing to 
sell their skills at entertaining people on a stage than they were also willing to sell their sexual services. Um, and it's not clear how far this extended, you know, maybe the most elite actresses, you know, the headliners in shows were not expected to, to turn tricks, um, but certainly lower down the ranks. So it's the chorus girls, they were called, who were sort of in the background of the performances. There was a general expectation that they were also uh, engaged in prostitution. Um, and, you know, as with all sort of general expectations. I'm sure that there were exceptions to this rule. I highly doubt every single actress was also a prostitute on the side, but clearly some were, or this association would not have existed. Uh, so there is an assumption in the way Procopius writes about Antonina's family history that Antonina's mother was not just an actress, but also a prostitute, uh, and that Antonina was therefore. Um, tainted, I guess is the word Procopius might use, by association uh, with her mother. Um, it's worth noting that Procopius at no point directly says that Antonina was an actress herself. He just talks about her mother being an actress. So he wants us to assume that Antonina followed in her mother's footsteps, but he doesn't actually come out and say that she followed in her mother's footsteps, which I think is interesting because it would have taken him three or four words to convey that information and he chose not to do that which which says something i think so what do we know about the shadow what profession she would take in the later as she grew up that is also a great question um so i in the book i describe two potential childhoods for antonina uh and the reason i do that is because we don't know how successful in particular, her father was as a chariot racer. Um, if he was a replacement level chariot racer, uh, barely squeaking by, then it's very possible that Antonina might have had to work. And if Antonina had to work, then she undoubtedly worked in the entertainment business because that's what her parents worked in. Maybe she wasn't an actress herself, but she clearly worked for that field. However, if her father was a slightly more successful chariot racer, we know that the more successful drivers of chariots made a good amount of money uh, for the time period. Mm -hmm. And in that case, Antonina wouldn't have had any profession. She wouldn't have had to work at all. She would have been raised at home in comfort and stayed in the home until she was married, um, the way other uh, ladies of means were uh, in this period. So, uh, those are the options. That's the range we have for Antonina's work, right? All the way from being an actress herself, maybe even turning tricks as a prostitute, to not working at all and being raised in a fairly pampered household. Do you have any other sources that the secret history that talk about Antonina as herself, or is it mainly that the secret history that we have on her early years? Yes, uh, Procopius is our only source for Antonina's early years. Uh, so we cannot corroborate what Procopius has to say about her family and childhood um, the way we can actually with Empress Theodora. Uh, Procopius actually says very nasty things about Theodora's uh, childhood and early years in the secret history. And we do actually have uh, a couple of ecclesiastical histories um, people who admired Theodora who admit that she came from, quote, the brothel. Mm -hmm. So with Theodora, we can corroborate what Procopius says. With Antonina, unfortunately, we cannot. Do we know, if, and I may get ahead of myself here, but do we know if Theodora and Antonina met before, before when they, she married Belisarius and Theodora married Justinian and then met through the both then Jane? That that sort of kind of Justinian Belisarius came to, together, or do we know how if they met before they Belisarius became the famous general? This is a good question, and another great illustration of that comment I made earlier about how, in some ways, we still know very little about these people, even though we know a lot about their their careers and what they did in public. Some things are still completely opaque to us, and this is one of them. So. It's entirely possible that Antonina and Theodora if I may, met. If I may interrupt, do we know how big the after scene were in Constantinople or Byzantine Empire, Eastern Roman Empire? 
at the time that they, they may have interacted if it wasn't that big of a scene. I mean, of course, it's not the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. So I mean, imagine it was quite huge. There was quite a lot of scenes, but do we know if, if, if it was like a small scene that they met, should have met that way or if it was like large that it may, they may not have met at all in their early years? It's entirely possible they would have run across each other as uh, members of the world of entertainment. So in Constantinople, which is a very large city, um, the entertainment sector maybe accounted for a couple of thousand jobs. Uh, so, I mean, this is a larger number, but not impossible that they might have crossed paths. Um, so it's not out of the question. Um, it's within the realm of possibility, and it wouldn't it wouldn't be unreasonable. Um, we know that Antonina at some point lost her first husband and had children by him. So she's a single mother before she meets Belisarius. And Theodora was famous for helping uh, young women who were down on their luck. And with the fact that they both came out of the entertainment world, it's not at all impossible that Antonina would have gone to Theodora and said, hey, could you help me out? My husband died. I'm trying to raise these children. Um, so they might have met that way. Uh, we don't know for sure, but it, it makes sense to me anyway. Now, before we go to the meeting, I want to, of course, we have, we have to talk about Belisarius' upbringing as well, because he was born in Fluria. So let's talk a little bit about his upbringing and where the family he came from. Right. So with Belisarius, uh, we know exactly where he was born. He was born in this small town in what is today Bulgaria, which was then named uh, Germania. And we know nothing about his family or his parents. Uh, so with Belisarius, we have this, again, a huge range of possibilities. He might have been from a very rich family. He might have been from a very poor family. Uh, we only know the region he came from, not the circumstances of his birth. I mean, I'm, I'm actually was must have been quite a uh, well of family if he managed to become a general in the Ro in the Roman army because it was mostly upper classes even in the Eastern Roman Empire, right? And as well as in the Western Roman Empire, that mostly the upper classes would become generals and not really a person. So it shouldn't have been a person if he became a general in the Roman army, right? That's a good point. Um, it's very possible that that might give some indication, uh, but we have a shortcut to becoming a general in the Roman army, especially under Justinian. Justinian favors people of humble background who come up with him in service. And Belisarius, as far as we know, is one of Justinian's personal bodyguards before Justinian becomes emperor. So Justinian sort of plucks him out of that guard unit and then sets him on a series of promotions. Um, so uh, if it was some other emperor that hadn't known Belisarius personally, we might assume he had to be of somewhat higher class to come to the emperor's notice. Mm -hmm. But with the fact that Justinian personally hand-selected Belisarius and promoted him from this early association... You know, he might have he might have, in fact, been of a very poor background and just been lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time to be noticed by the future emperor. Let's talk about him going into the military career. And uh, as, as you mentioned, how he would come to meet Justin and they would know if it was just, that, like you said, it was just a lucky coincidence. Or even know if they actually they seem to be getting along, must have been gotten along quite well for him to be that. Lucky to get, as you said, so many promotions and eventually becoming the general of the Roman army. Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, Justinian uh, has the, a very similar background to Belisarius, at least as far as we can tell. They both come from uh, the Balkans. Uh, they both come from uh, southeastern Europe. They both come from uh rural regions within southeastern Europe. Uh, they both sort of work their way up through the ranks. Uh, Justinian, of course, is helped by his uncle Justin being the emperor, uh, but Belisarius is helped by Justinian uh, guiding him. Uh, so we can sort of draw this, this chain of influence from Justin to Justinian to Belisarius um, through, through their promotions. Uh, so uh, the army is a vehicle for um, upward mobility, at least for some people during this time.
So let's we kind mm-hmm. of touch a little bit upon this, but let's talk about how he met, met Antonina and how how they would like you said you said it she could have been introduced by Theodora, but let's talk a little bit about how their relationship would work out because as you met talk about they did seem quite close and they may even have loved each other because like you talked about she went on with him on several and you we'll talk about this later as well of course but how she would later go on with with him on campaign so there must have been must have been quite a good match yes i think so and this is something that has not been explored a lot by other historians. They they get distracted, as I'm sure we'll talk about later, by the accusations of the bad things that happened mm-hmm. between Belisarius and Antonina. But but clearly they the two must have had some considerable regard for each other because Belisarius is this up and coming swashbuckling general. Uh, he has the favor of the emperor. He's he's the the favored, uh, you know, chosen one in the army. Uh, he pretty pretty much could have picked whom he might have wanted to marry, and he chooses Antonina, who is at least by the standards of the time, um, not the obvious choice for a young sort of up and coming general in his in his twenties. Antonina is a little bit older than him. She's already been married and widowed. She has at least two children. Uh, She doesn't have any kind of distinguished family ancestry to recommend her. She probably doesn't have any kind of wealth to recommend her. Um, But Belisarius picks her, possibly because... He made your comparison. It's almost a little bit like Napoleon and Josephine, in a sense. Yes, I think that's a reasonable comparison. he didn't have to pick her, right? Mm. Uh, but but he did. He was he was struck by her. And with Napoleon and Josephine, we're very fortunate to have letters uh, yeah. written by them that that sort of testify to this relationship. I would love to see some kind of letters like that between Belisarius and Antonina. We have none, um, so we can't rely on that for evidence that they loved each other. Uh, unfortunately, I can I can try to imagine Belisarius and uh, Justine kind of going on double dates because. Yes, uh, that's right. Yeah, I, I don't quite make that point in the book about double dates, but I did draw <laughs> attention. They have this these similarities, right? Justinian and Belisarius yeah, yeah. are these these generals of rural origin. Theodore and Antonina are these urbane ladies of entertainment yeah. origin that are very cosmopolitan. They're used to the city. Um, so the, there, there's some huge similarities here, which can't be a coincidence that these four people yeah. ended up working so well together. They 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 felt drawn together, I think. I actually want to, if I remember correctly, and I may not, but you kind of draw, talked about as well, how it would kind of become the norm in a sense that Theodora would marry up one of these girls to politicians in just in Justinian's in just to Justin that were politicians and they would they would kind of be more common in a way that politicians marry these actresses in after you know both Belisarius and Justinian had these successful marriages and that and Theodora especially I don't know how much Antonina would do this but you know they it did seem to be more common after you know these two marriages as well. Yes, uh, there is there's a sense that Theodora, perhaps, or somebody is sort of pulling strings and arranging some of these marriages to sort of tie together Justinian's sort of military class of, of generals and supporters and and Theodora's uh, family and friends and supporters like they're sort of uniting these these two worlds, the urban entertainment world and the and the rural military world. Now we have to, of course, talk about Belisarius' campaigns as well, because we, we, it would be kind of criminal not to when he come, when we do talk about him. So let's sort of begin with the first one with him against uh, the Nikita uprising that he puts down in five thirty two. Yes, yeah, so this was the moment in his reign in which Justinian was in the most danger, uh, and. I don't know how much detail we want to go into here, but I'm, uh, I'm, you have opened the ring. It's trains. <laughs> uh, Justinian severely mismanaged some popular demonstrations. We'll start there. 
there was a public execution scheduled and a couple of individuals from the green and blue sporting factions survived the execution. So it was a botched execution. And the populace who saw this happen believed that they had been spared by God. So they requested the emperor to pardon them, uh, sort of uh, uh, for Americans in a way that the idea of double jeopardy, you can't be tried twice for the same crime here. You can't be executed twice for the same yeah. crime. You know, <laughs> you failed to execute them. They should be let go. Yeah. Uh, so this seems like a relatively straightforward uh, request for the regular people to make. And this is a very common part of the late antique Roman world. There's a give and take between the emperor and his people over issues like this. Very normal for the people to make requests of their emperor. Very normal of the emperor to respond. Justinian completely mismanages the situation. I mean, it's a total botch. Um, he first ignores them. He doesn't respond yes or no. And then when the populace sees that the emperor is ignoring him, them, they're not engaging in the normal back and forth, uh, they begin to get angry. So they start ripping up the stands and, you know, rioting. Uh, and so the emperor eventually says, oh, well, you know, uh, maybe I should have responded. But by then it's too late. The populace has literally broken the people out and freed them themselves because the emperor hasn't agreed to do it uh, and then proceed to run amok throughout the city. So Justinian is desperately trying to calm these people down. This is in January of 532. Uh, and he appears in the Hippodrome, the big racing arena, uh, in front of all these rioting people. And he Isn't this apologizes. kind of where Theodora kind of saves the situation as well, where she you know, helps out, if I remember correctly, that she helps calm the situation and that, that she's kind of the hero of the hour. Yes, yes. Uh, so when Justinian's ploy to apologize to the people doesn't work, uh, we're told anyway that Justinian considers fleeing, um, loading himself, his wife, his treasury, his loyal supporters on boats and just getting out of town. And according to Procopius, our main source for this palace dialogue, Theodora stands up and delivers a speech to Justinian and his allies in which she concludes by saying, if you want to run away, there's the boats. But as for me, I'm going to stay here because I believe that the best burial sheet is the imperial purple. Mm. So in other words, she's, she's saying, I'd rather die an empress than run away and survive. Mm. Um, so this steals the backs of the men involved in the situation, and they agree that they are not going to run away but at this point, the riot is so out of control that really the only choices were to run away or to put it down violently by force. Um, and so since they've already now ruled out running away, they decide to put it down by force. So Justinian turns to uh, the two loyal generals he has in the capital with him. And one of them happens to be our man, Belisarius. He divides up the available soldiers and bodyguards amongst these two generals and sends them out. And the people have assembled in the Hippodrome again to proclaim emperor a rival of Justinian. And so oh, Belisarius and the other general, whose name is Mundus, uh, enter the Hippodrome from opposite sides. Uh, and they proceed to pull swords and cut their way through the crowd. Uh, Belisarius's job is to pull down the potential rebel emperor, uh, while the other general's job is apparently crowd control. And uh, what, is, there, is it a massacre in a way? It's a massacre, yes. Uh, Procopius tells us that 30,000 people are killed uh, in this one afternoon, uh, which uh it's hard to know if we should take that number at face value um it's possible but it would have taken a long time because this was not a large army yeah. you know each each of the two of them had maybe a few hundred guardsmen and soldiers with them so for all those people to be killed by 600 a thousand guards I mean, even, even by machine guns today it would take quite a while to massacre 30,000 people Right. And they're, of course, just using their swords and spears. Um, so 
it's hard to know if that many people were actually killed, but this is undoubtedly, even if it's not 30,000, this is a bloody moment. This is a popular uprising put down by the brute force, by the, uh, the, the boot of, of the military here to keep Justinian uh, in power. And it succeeds. The rebellion is, is quashed. The potential rebel is executed and his body is thrown into the sea. Uh, and peace eventually returns to the city. And Belisarius has cemented his reputation as being loyal to his emperor because he literally uh, killed off civilians to ensure Justinian's rule. I mean, we, meant, so that we talked about 30,000, but even if it was just 1,500 and 1,000 or 500 or 10,000, it would have been pretty bad, still pretty high numbers. If you go, if it's 5 or 10, 1,500 people, it's still pretty high number to massacre in one day. Yes, yeah, even if you, yeah, cut it. And especially when, it's civil, especially when it's civilians as well, that make it even worse. Right, and it's and it's done in in full public view, right? Everybody knows this has happened. Um, so uh, you have to imagine that it doesn't make Belisarius super popular <laughs> in, yeah. in that moment. So we don't just had we don't have time to talk about all the campaign that Belisarius did. That's an episode in itself, of course. But let's let's start with it. I want to bring up, of course, one of the most famous campaigns, and that is the reconquering of. Italy and the Italian campaign. And we talked a little bit about the Cyrus in the last week's episode, actually, which is now yet by the time I record this, but it's the and it's about the Roman roads. And I want to talk a little bit about the roads that Belisarius took as well to conquer Italy Italy, because we speak a little bit about the Roman roads he took on the way to Italy as well in that episode. So let's talk a little bit about the get, gathering the army to conquer Italy and the journey to Italy and the conquering of Italy and the, how how and I want to discuss as well afterwards how the consequences of conquering Italy too of course. Sure. Yes. The 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 war in Italy is quite interesting. Um, I guess if we if we draw a big picture of it, um, it's a very long war, and when historians look at the war in Italy, but between the Romans of Justinian and the Ostrogoths, they tend to focus on how it ended. Uh, and by the end of this war, Italy is, is not in great shape. It's been hit by not just the crisscrossing of armies and the battles and sieges, but also the plague. Uh, there was also a climactic event, a volcanic eruption, which caused a couple of years worth of cooling. Um, so Italy's in very bad shape. It's depopulated. It's kind of wrecked by the end of this war. Um, but most of that damage comes in the very latter half of the war. Uh, Belisarius's great success in Italy uh, is between uh, 536 and 540. And during this period, very little of Italy is uh, is damaged or destroyed. So um, I thought I'd, I'd make that point at least as we get started talking about this. Uh, but the war in Italy begins um, very anticlimactically with Belisarius and the Roman army taking Sicily uh, in 535. Uh, and that is... Uh, essentially bloodless. Uh, Belisarius uh, enters into Syracuse uh, to the adoring crowds. Uh, he has a brief um, uh, fight at Panormus where the Ostrogoths attempt to, withhold, to hold him out, uh, but soon surrender. And otherwise, the rest of the island falls to Belisarius in 535 um, without uh, much trouble. Uh, and Belisarius winters there uh, and then in 536, he crosses the Straits of Messina uh, to begin his trip through Italy proper. Uh, and this is uh, the beginning of uh, a two-part war. Uh, the first part in which Belisarius has no problem whatsoever, and he is welcomed everywhere he goes. The second part uh where he begins to face stiffer resistance and it takes longer. So uh, we can cover that in, in whatever yeah. order you'd like or talk about roads, whatever you'd prefer. 
I actually want to talk a little bit about the consequences of conquering Rome and Italy, because you know it's some it's the debating in some debates today. It's my understanding in the long run if it hurt the Eastern Roman Empire in the long run, or if it was more if if it helped the if if it did help or if it hurt the Roman. What is your stance on this? What was how did in the long run the conquest? of Italy, did it, do you feel like it hurt the Eastern Roman Empire in the long run, or did it actually, was it a good thing for the Eastern Roman Empire, for the matter of the worse? This is a, a great question. Yeah, there's, there's a big debate among historians of this period uh, over whether Justinian's Western adventures, as we might loosely call them, uh, were helpful harmful or neutral to the empire's success in the long run. So when we talk about that, we're talking uh, not just about Italy, of course, but also uh, North Africa, uh, which Justinian uh, reconquered before Italy. Uh, and there's a corner of uh, Spain, uh, the southeastern corner of Spain, which he reconquers after uh, the war uh, in Italy is mostly over. So together, those three regions uh, sort of represent um, Justinian's Western um, adventures uh, during this time period. So there's a couple ways of, of thinking about this. Uh, some historians make a very aggressive case that Justinian's wars were very damaging to the health of the empire in the long run because they distracted imperial attention uh, from core problems in what were today the Balkans uh, or uh, the empire's Eastern front with the Persian empire. Um, and they also distracted uh, or, or took away rather military resources from these regions, because of course you need armies, uh, you need uh, governors, you need an administration and bureaucracy in all these areas that Justinian takes over in the West. Um, so I think the best case uh, for that, or probably at least the most recent one, was made uh, by Anthony Caldellis uh, in his book, mm -hmm. uh, The New Roman Empire, uh, which just came out uh, this year. Um, then there's an argument to be made that uh, the taking over of certain lands in the West actually provided a net benefit to the empire, at least for a time. Uh, so one of the older arguments made here is that Justinian retook North Africa, and it was from North Africa that the general Heraclius came and overthrew Phocas, and Heraclius eventually defeated the Persians in the Great War uh, at the end of antiquity. Uh, in the okay, also, century. by the way, made an episode about two weeks ago by the time this episode is released as well. Excellent. And who did you talk to for that? Uh, I don't have his, James Howard Johnson was his name. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. His book is the one I was referring to. It's yeah. called The Last Great War of Antiquity. Yeah, he doesn't important. himself directly make this case about Justinian's war making Heraclius possible, but um, that's that's the connection I'm drawing here. There would be no Heraclius without a North Africa. Um, uh, and then there's also a way to look at it from sort of uh, a, a tax perspective uh, and an income perspective. And this has been recently done by uh, Peter Heather in a book and uh, by Michael Whitby in a book, uh, which suggests that the recovery of certain territories like North Africa and Sicily in particular was actually a net positive for the imperial treasury because these were still productive areas uh, and they actually returned more to the treasury than they cost for upkeep and defense and administration and that kind of thing. Um, Italy, unfortunately, does not fall under that category because it was so ravaged throughout the course of this war. So um, to go back to your original question, if you're looking at just peninsular Italy, then it was definitely a, a sort of a net negative for the empire. It, it, it dragged the empire into uh, lots of local problems and quarrels. Uh, it caused a significant drain on resources. Um, but if you consider Justinian's Western adventures as a whole, including you know North Africa, Sicily, the uh, Balearic Islands, it is the closest Islands, you come to actually re remaking the old Roman Empire in a way, just within the capital in Constantinople and not well in Rome. 
Yes. Yeah. Uh, at its height, Justinian's empire basically turns the Mediterranean into a Roman lake again for the first time uh, in in well over a century. Uh, the only parts of the Mediterranean coastline that he really does not control uh, are a little bit of uh, southern Gaul, uh, France, and a little bit of, of uh, northeastern Spain. Otherwise, the basically of course, the entire Britain Mediterranean is coastline. Out of the picture as well. <laughs> Yes, Britain uh, long out of the picture uh, by this point, um, which the Romans themselves recognize. Uh, there's a there's a great anecdote during the Ostrogothic War after the Romans have already conquered Sicily. Uh, the Ostrogoths are trying to arrange for a peace deal with the Romans. They want the war ended. Uh, and so the Ostrogothic ambassadors say to Belisarius, well, if you'll end the war, we'll give you Sicily. And Belisarius, since he already controls Sicily, thinks this is a kind of absurd proposal. So he responds, well, if you'll end the war, we'll give you Britain, which, of course, Belisarius and the Romans have not controlled for, for many, many uh, generations at this point. So the, the joke is, of course, the Ostrogoths no more control Sicily than the Romans control Britain at this time. So that's one way we can loop Britain into the discussion here. Yeah. Now, of course, we have to go back to Antonina as well, of course. And... Is she with him on this the Italian campaign as well, or is she back in Constantinople at this point? Yes, Antonina is uh, at Belisarius' side at this point. Uh, and this is one of the things that I find very remarkable about their relationship, is she travels with him to North Africa, to Italy, uh, and even makes it out to the eastern frontier with the Persians uh, at one point. Uh, so she spends a number of years of her life on military campaign with Belisarius and his army, uh, which is uh, is very remarkable and shows uh, quite a bit of dedication to her husband's career. Now, we have to talk a little bit about the treasury that Belisarius held hoards in, of course, because it would become quite rich Oh, on this campaign, and of course, we will discuss later how he falls from grace as well. But let begin with talking. We have to talk about the treasury of Belisarius as well. Yes, so I, I have a little uh, a little appendix at the end of the book where I try to grapple with the kind of wealth that Belisarius must have had. And this is a little difficult because we're never straight out told how much money he has. You know, it's not like today where we're constantly bombarded with information about how much money the richest people in our world society have, right? We all know what yeah. billionaires have, right? We're, we're told net worth all the yeah. time, but we don't have that kind of information for the sixth century, unfortunately. Um, but we know you that- know he was Belis rich. Yes, we know Belisarius was rich because he had thousands of personal bodyguards uh, that, that he paid for out of his own pocket. Uh, we know that Belisarius was rich because the emperor confiscated his money uh, when he fell from grace. We'll talk about that later. Um, and we suspect Belisarius is rich because in his campaigns, he captured not one but two royal treasuries. Uh, the first was the Vandal treasury, which he captured in Carthage in North Africa. And the second, the Ostrogothic royal treasury, which he captured in Ravenna in northern Italy. And... Of course, in theory, Belisarius, being a loyal servant to his emperor, brought this wealth from these treasuries back to Justinian and presented it to the emperor to put into the imperial Roman treasury. But, However, he said, one for you, two for me, one for you, <laughs> two for me. <laughs> exactly. Who knows what kind of accounting went on before mm. this transfer yeah. took place. Um, there, there's a certain amount of... Uh, graft and corruption, which was expected uh, during this period. And so the idea that Belisarius, with the support and assistance, perhaps, of his wife, Antonina, uh, skimmed some off the top yeah. uh, is not at all outside the realm of possibility. He had to get his wealth from somewhere, and this certainly would explain where he got some of his wealth. So Belisarius ends up fantastically wealthy, and he just so happened to capture two royal treasuries so we, we add that math together a plus b equals he must have probably skimmed yeah. a little bit off the top here was this common common not just among for belisarius but among successful roman emperor sorry not emperors but generals at the time that they was like we said skim up a little bit on top 
for themselves and they were, were very wealthy Roman generals. Yes, yes, this is not at all um, uncommon. Uh, we know from the various writings of other Romans during this time period, um, especially uh, a Roman civil servant named John Lytus, who writes about uh, sort of the the bribes that were common in the civil service. We know about it from the civil service point of view. So uh, if that's happening in the civil service with, you know, your regular accountants and secretaries in Constantinople under the emperor's nose, then it's definitely happening with generals and armies out on frontiers who captured, happen to capture a, a fortress here or a city treasury there or something like that. So um, not at all uncommon for um, individual generals to make some wealth that way. Now, we have to talk about the dark side of this as well, of course, because it wasn't all roses and happy times. Because there, of course, the as in the in the secret history, there is talk about affairs, and even at one point, because of course, if you don't like someone, you, the easiest way to actually accuse someone, it seems, if you write a history, is incest. So, let's talk a little bit about some of the so-called affairs that Antonina Antonin may have or may not have had in in during the marriage. Yes. Yeah, so the the big. The big black mark on both the history of Belisarius and Antonina, and the one that everybody loves to come back to because it's so salacious uh, and so hair-raising, is this accusation that Antonina seduced and then had a long-running affair with her adopted son. So this is a young man by the name of this Theodosius. This is kind of general, like I said, this is kind of Sorry for interrupting you again, but this is kind of general when people write history, like you have Eleanor on faculty and later would have incest with her uncle or some other guy or some when someone like Mike Natalegula had incest with his sister his sisters as well. So it seems to be a kind of a common theme that incest, if you don't like someone, that's how oh, she had definitely sex with some her family. That kind of seems to be like a common theme about history writers if you don't really like the person you write about. Yes, that's very perceptive of you, uh, and and well done to draw those connections with other sort of well known examples. Uh, this is a common theme uh, or or literary trope when when you don't like a powerful woman, uh, you accuse her of some sort of sexual deviancy, uh, and the more you don't like her, the more you wish to make her look bad. You make it even more. Yeah. Um, taboo uh, and, and terrible sounding. So if she's only sort of bad, you know, maybe she's just a regular adulteress that has sex with somebody else's husband mm -hmm. or something like that. But if she's really bad, then you make it not just an adulterous affair, but an incestual adulterous affair, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you sort of take it up to that level. So, so the accusation against Antonina is sort of that literary tradition theme dialed all the way up to 11. So it's not just that she has an affair, it's that she has an incestuous affair. It's not just that she has an incestuous affair, she has an incestuous affair with what we would consider to be an underaged minor. So that makes it also uh, pedophilia. Uh, so uh, we don't know Theodosius. Of a female with the yes, yes. Uh, we don't know Theodosius' exact age. Uh, so I speculate that at the time the alleged affair took place, he was he was probably a, a teenager still. Um, so, you know, what we have to grapple with, with this accusation uh, is whether we believe it or not. Mm. Um, and this is sort of one of the central themes of, of my book. And one of the questions, one of the biggest questions I had to deal with um, because almost all historians over the past several hundred years have simply taken this as true. It must have happened. Um, and there's good reason for that because the words come from Procopius and Procopius knew Belisarius and Antonina personally. He was Belisarius's personal secretary. If any historian of the time period would have known something like this was happening, it, it would be Procopius. So most modern historians have taken that and said, well, this definitely happened. This was definitely true. And it's colored the way we look at Belisarius and Antonina ever since, um, because this one accusation 
just demolishes both of their reputations completely. Antonina becomes uh, not just a bad mother, but uh, a sexual pervert, um, a sexual assaulter, a criminal. Uh, and Belisarius, because he didn't stop it, is not just a cuckolded husband. He's also uh, a wimp. He's enthralled to his wife. He can't he can't stop her from committing horrible criminal acts uh, because he is so infatuated with her. So it makes both of them look terrible. Makes them both look quite terrible. So can it possibly be true? Well, anything could possibly be true. But the fact that we only know about this affair from the secret history, which is designed to make Belisarius, Antonina, Justinian, and Theodora look bad, should cause us to pause for a moment. Mm. Because if we say, we know Procopius wanted to make them look bad, how could he have done that in a way that is very effective? We could scarcely imagine a more effective way to make all these people look bad than this particular story, uh, vile as it is. So to me anyway, uh, the story reeks as something that was created by Procopius to slime these individuals, to ruin their reputations. And it certainly has uh, for hundreds of years. So, but it's not improbable, so not improbable that both is in hard affairs because it's like we, we know from history, among the elite affairs were generally, generally quite common among the upper class. And it's, so it's not improbable that both of them may have had affairs in, though maybe not with their adopted son, but they may have most probably, not, or it's not imp improbable, maybe better word, that they had affairs themselves. Yeah, that's a, that's fair. Uh, we might imagine that they had other affairs um, and that Procopius has, has taken that information, twisted it and made it more excruciating in this example. And that's, uh, that's not exactly what I argue in the book, but that's sort of similar. Uh, I argue that there must have been some kind of common knowledge baseline argument between Belisarius and Antonina that took place that most of their compatriots and friends knew about. So Procopius took that and then twisted it into something more disturbing, more vile than it actually yeah. was for the secret history. So before we go into the, how Belisarius and Antonina fell from grace of Justinian, I want to talk a little bit about their family, family as well, internal family. Um, because it's my understanding that children have a child on their own. And if one of them was infertile, I don't know if Belisarius was infertile or not, but they did end up adopting and they did not seem to be parent of a year, to put it that way, from what I understand. Yes, uh, Belisarius and Antonina uh, were very good at very many things, uh, but parenting does not seem to have been their strong suit. Um, so Antonina had at least two children from her previous marriage, uh, a daughter whose name we don't know, and a son whose name was Photius. And Belisarius and Antonina together adopted Theodosius, the young man that Antonina is accused of seducing. Uh, and they did actually have, at least according to the sources, uh, one biological child together, a daughter named Ioannina. Uh, so this is the core nuclear family that we're looking at uh, for uh, this group. Uh, but what stands out to me about their parenting is that as far as we know, Io and Nina spends hardly any time with her parents while she's growing up. She's left in Constantinople uh, with uh, nannies, with uh, maybe extended relatives. Um, Again, because... well, it wasn't that uncommon, though, that you would let taking care of by nannies, or if you were in the upper class day, you kind of had to, especially in the later early modern era, you were sent to boarding school or something, but it's, again, in, in, in the middle, mid medieval era, you were, if you were upper class, you were most likely left to nannies to take care of you. So it wasn't quite uncommon though, was it? That you were left no, to um, I don't think that part's uncommon. The part that I believe might be uncommon is that Belisarius, uh, Belisarius and Antonina were outside uh, of Constantinople for about seven of 
young Ionina's first hmm. 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, to, to lay, have them raised by nannies is a little bit different than to not see them at all. Yeah. That's the true. majority That's of their, yeah. of their early life. Um, and the other children, uh, did travel with Belisarius and Antonina on their campaigns, uh, and came along with them. Uh, but we had imagined this was uh, not the easiest circumstances to be raising them. And uh, they were arguing, uh, Photius and uh, Theodosius, the young adopted son, were arguing uh, over the course of many years. Uh, and Belisarius and Antonia seem to have mostly ignored it until it blew up in their faces. So let's talk about a little bit about how Belisarius eventually would lose his treasury to Justinian, Justinian and fall from his favor and fall from grace. And we will discuss in a few minutes about how the destiny of Belisarius. Yes. So uh, the big event at the heart of Justinian's reign, which really changes the character uh, of the reign, uh, is something that Justinian could not have predicted. It's an outbreak of bubonic plague, uh, which would become known by just the, the extremely damaging uh, to the empire and to its citizens. It killed millions of people. Uh, so in uh, the early 540s, uh, this plague uh, sweeps up north out of Egypt uh, and races across the empire like wildfire. Uh, and by summer of 542, uh, Justinian himself has been infected by this bubonic plague and he is lying ill in bed in Constantinople. So word reaches uh, Belisarius, who is at this point on the Eastern Front with the Persians um, in what is today Southeastern Turkey. And uh, the rumor, we don't know exactly what it is, whether it's just Justinian is very ill, whether the rumor is actually Justinian has died, um, but Belisarius and his fellow officers in the army apparently begin talking. Uh, and the discussion revolves around what to do if Justinian has in fact died or is about to die. And according to, again, our author Procopius, uh, Belisarius and the other officers agree that they will not accept an emperor appointed from Constantinople, but that a good general must become the emperor. So, you know, reading between the lines, Belisarius' name is not mentioned as the candidate here, but you read between the lines. This is a discussion in the camp of Belisarius' army, and it's supposed to be a good general. Well, obviously, they're talking about it should be Belisarius. Mm -hmm. um, so the rumor of this gets back to Constantinople, where Justinian makes a recovery, he doesn't die of the plague. He survives. Uh, and according to Procopius, Justinian and Theodora, very disappointed upon hearing this, they recall Belisarius to Constantinople to explain himself. Uh, when he gets there, he can offer no explanation that satisfies them. So Belisarius is immediately sacked. Uh, he is stripped of his title. He is stripped of his office. Uh, he is stripped of his personal bodyguards that he has around him. Uh, and finally, as you pointed out earlier, his his wealth is confiscated uh, by the imperial treasury. Uh, so Belisarius uh, still has a home, we know, because he returns to his home after this. But uh, he's lost all of his official capacity uh, and the vast majority of his personal wealth. Uh, and he is persona non grata uh, to the imperial couple, which is uh, as uh, readers of previous Roman history will be aware, it's a precarious position. Uh, to say the least. Mm. So this is Belisarius's big fall from grace in summer 542. But doesn't it fall in again, though he doesn't give back in favor with Justinian, though he doesn't get his wealth back, but he falls in favor again a little later with Justinian? Yes. Uh, so uh, the story of Belisarius goes on because uh, sometime later, it's not clear exactly how much time has elapsed, um, six months perhaps, uh, Belisarius is recalled to the palace uh, and he is restored to favor. Uh, he is given back some portion of his wealth, not all of it. He gets back some portion of his wealth 
uh, and he is reinstated uh, as a general uh, in the Imperial service. And he gets sent out to Italy uh, a second time. So his career has a resurgence here uh, and he'll go on to be a general for uh, at least uh, five more years, maybe something more like seven uh, before he ends up uh, retiring. So uh, Belisarius comes back, uh, rises from the ashes like a phoenix and and resumes his service of his emperor. Do we know why Justinian suddenly had a change of heart and that didn't, maybe I should have this guy back on my team anyway? It was just strategic. Recently, didn't know he was a valuable, loyal soldier. Maybe, maybe loyal, not loyal, loyal after his attempt, possible attempt to coup, but you know, was he a strategic general to have on his team? Is that why, why, there, why we think that he fell back in favor? That's a that's great speculation there. I like that. Um, so the simple answer is we don't know exactly. Uh, we're given all of this information from Procopius about the reasons for his fall from grace. But for his restoration, the only thing Procopius tells us is that Theodora asked Justinian to restore Belisarius as a favor to Antonina. So Procopius makes it look like it's basically the two women that are primarily involved as the prime movers here. Mm. Um, I find that personally a little hard to believe just because Justinian and Belisarius had the longer relationship. They've known each other a long time. And Justinian was the one with the most to lose if Belisarius was actually a potential, you know, rebel or usurper. So I find it hard to believe that, that Justinian and Belisarius were uninvolved completely in the decision to restore Belisarius to his position. And we know from other examples that Justinian is a man who exercises uh, the Roman and Christian tradition of clemency. Uh, Justinian likes to forgive people for their misdeeds. It's a part of his, if not his character, then at least his self-presentation. He wants to be seen as being a forgiving type of person. So I think it, it would fit Justinian's character to want to restore Belisarius to a position of authority. Uh, and Belisarius might have had something to do with it as well. Maybe he promised the emperor, you know, I'm not going to rebel against you. I've always been loyal to you. Maybe he reminded the emperor that he fought civilians in the Nika riot uh, mm -hmm. for Justinian. We can't know for sure, but I can imagine that some combination of all these factors probably created this moment for Belisarius to be restored. Now, it's, it's a good round up soon, but I want to talk a little bit, as you do in the book as well, about the aftermath of Belisarius and Belisarius in both fiction and plays and how he will live on in our history after his passing. Yes, uh, so uh, Belisarius dies in 565 um, and Justinian dies about uh, eight months later, also in 565. And then um, Belisarius immediately passes from the realm of, of history into legend. Uh, and we have these different ways in which he is remembered. Um, sometimes he's remembered as this heroic general who won wars for Justinian. Uh, but increasingly, as the years go by, there is a legend that develops around Belisarius, which says that he was disgraced by Justinian and blinded and then set out penniless in the streets to beg his living from people passing by. Mm -hmm. This uh, legend has no basis in the historical reality of the period. No contemporary sources uh, accuse Justinian of blinding Belisarius. There's no indication that this actually happened, but it, it's a legend that strikes people as plausible and more than that strikes them as interesting because it makes it seem that this could happen to anybody uh, so it's sort of a, a visceral um, emotional rendering of the idea of the wheel of fortune right that it, it that it spins and that sometimes you're at the top and you're wealthy and successful but then that wheel spins again you find yourself at the bottom yeah. and you are blinded, broke, penniless, begging in the streets. Um, so I think that story resonated with people as a way of thinking about the, the twists and turns of fate and fortune in this world. Uh, and it became 
the primary way that Belisarius was remembered uh, for a number of years, particularly in the early modern period, I highlight at the end of my book, uh, there's this stretch of time, uh, oh, about a century uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries in which Belisarius is remembered primarily not as this great warrior or this great general, uh, but as uh, this exceedingly moral and distinguished figure who was wrongly accused by his emperor were blinded uh, and and then sort of had to end his life in in relative sort of poverty uh, and and the sad state. Um, so uh, this is how Belzar is remembered in art and literature for for quite a while. There's uh, there's novels, there's operas, uh, there's paintings and statuary, all of the the blind and begging Belisarius. I think we've done a round of there. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I most certainly did. Before you go, thank you again so much for coming on the podcast. And of course, do you have anything you you want to promote on social media where people might find you or links you want to share in the description? And of course, where can people buy your book if they want to read more about sure, yes. and Antonina if they are interested in learning more because we only touched the tip of the iceberg in this episode, of course, from what you write about. So if, if if you want to find you and have further questions or want to read a book or anything else you want to share, feel free to do it now. Yes, thank you. My book, Belisarius and Antonina, is uh, out from Oxford University Press. You can find it on Amazon or any other decent bookseller that you would like to use. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, also known as X. I am at Byzantine Prof. Uh, and I also, if you're interested in some of my other writing, you're not sure you want to splurge on a book yet, uh, I maintain a list of my published articles uh, on uh, academia.edu, and we'll make sure that gets in the description. So you could read uh, short form articles from me if you're not sure you want to read a book just yet. Thank you. And I, I may, may I mention as well, it's of course available on Audible as well, if you want to listen to the audio version of the book as well. So thank you again so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a great pleasure to have you on. This has been one that aged well. You can find us on social media on what and on and with that aged well on Instagram and with that aged well and same as Twitter slash X. You can find us on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can find podcasts these days. If you are on Spotify, please give us five stars. That would be very nice. Unless you hated this episode, you can give us one, which I hope you didn't. But it's a free world that is in this part of the world. So feel free to give how many stars you like. And of course, if you are on Apple Podcasts, consider writing a review of this podcast. If you like. And as well, check out some other episodes. I'm sure you have something you might find interesting. This has been one that aged well. That aged well. Sorry about that. My name is Alan, and I'll see you next time.